my name is Victor, and I'm going to be giving a talk about uh, the science behind acquiring skill. Um, about me, um, I'm a software engineer at Agape Red. Um, I do Android and web development, mainly Android. And a little fun fact, I think chai lattes are overrated. Just my opinion. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, practice and the process of practicing and how you can do it the best. So I'm going to start off with a quote. Uh, we do not rise to the level of ex our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. And what this quote kind of shows is, as humans, we are way more optimistic on what we can do. But in reality, what we fall back on is what we naturally can do without thinking. Um, so, uh, so my motives. So just like anybody else in the world, I enjoy improving myself. Um, I think that's a pretty natural trait to have. Um, so I read a lot of self-help books, a lot of books to try to improve a certain skill set and whatnot. And what I found over the years is I would read these books, um, and the piles of books would stack up. But the problem was I would read them, a lot, there was a lot of good content in them, but eventually I'd kind of, the, the content from the book would kind of drift away in my brain, I wouldn't really remember that much from them. Um, so it kind of turned into a situation where I read, read a 200 page book, but I only remember about like one or two tidbits of information. So um, my goal was to research and create a system uh, where I can acquire these skills better and see what I'm doing wrong and try to make them stick longer. Because um, I feel like a lot of our problems in life is the gap between where we are and where we want to be. Um, so if you know the process of getting there, it makes it a lot easier and makes it a lot more efficient. Um, so I, I kind of fell in the trap that I talked about just a second ago where I was fine with acquiring knowledge. I would, I would read books, um, it would make sense to me, but I'm reading those books from the comfort of my home. Um, and that kind of showed a sense of uh, false progress where uh, I, I, I knew more stuff, but I didn't technically know how to do more. Um, so performance is only improved through a skill and not knowledge, right? I can know everything in the world about the sport of tennis, but if I don't go on the tennis court and actually hit tennis balls, I'm not going to get better at it. And I feel like a lot of us get caught in the trap of thinking, replacing knowledge for skill. Um, the issue with skill itself, is, it's very unsafe, right? You have to go out there and you have to fail. You have to go out there and be bad. You have to go out there and put yourself in front of people and fail in front of them. And there's, there's a lot that goes into it that kind of harms your ego. Um, but skill is truly where true progress comes from. And our lives are, the good qualities in our lives are all skills that uh, we can improve on. Um, so here's a brief outline of my talk. So I'm going to talk about uh, the myth of talent briefly, um, kind of the neurology that goes behind skill. Uh, what is deliberate practice and components of deliberate practice and how you can perform them. So the myth of, the myth of talent um, is it's kind of taught to us at an early age that this person's naturally good at this, this person's naturally good at that, why try at this because I'm not good at it naturally. Uh, but the reality is that there's really no research pointing to the fact that people are born bad at anything. I, I mean granted there's some limitations where I'm not going to be a center in the NBA. Um, you know, there, there are those physical limitations that you can't get around, but they're a lot fewer and far between than you would uh, naturally think. So some research did a, uh, some research on this uh, where they tested kids' IQ um, before they started to learn a new trait or a new skill, and um, they, they charted their progress over time. And what they found was initially in the first year-ish, um, the people with higher IQs, they did learn faster. Um, I, I don't know if IQ translates in, into uh, be able to um, visualize concepts better, or I don't know what it is, but the fact is, after about a year or so, the two graphs kind of converged. So there wasn't, um, the person who started off faster didn't necessarily mean, it didn't necessarily mean that they were going to be better in the long run. Um, so if you, so there's a good quote from Michael Andrews saying, if, um, if people knew how hard I worked to get my mastery, it wouldn't see so, seem so wonderful at all. Um, and I, I think this kind of follows along with, if you go up to any person at the top of their field and you tell them, you know, the only reason they're there is because they're talented, um, I think it's probably one of the most disrespectful things you could say to them because you don't see the work they put in um, from the times they're in the spotlight. So I'm going to start off in talking about the, what happens in your brain with skill. So um, it's pretty simple. So the brain is made up of neurons. Um, these neurons are linked together. And to do anything requires a precise neural pathway to execute. 
Um, and, and it has to be this way, right? If I, if I think I want to move my hand left to right and it goes up and down, well, I'm going to die quickly. So it kind of has to be that way. Um, so the repetition of these pathways tells the body that, hey, these, these are of higher value. I need, I need to know how to do this better. Um, so that increased frequency triggers the brain to want to optimize those certain pathways. Um, so what happens is there's actually a substance involved with this. It's called myelin. And what it does is it wraps these pathways that we um, execute a lot. And um, however, the process is very slow. It's a slow building process. You're not going to have one day have none and the next day have all of it. Um, but it, it, is, it, it does produce in just about anything we do. Um, and there is good news. Other than a few rare cases in the world, we all produce myelin and we all are producing it now um, and with anything we do. So a simple formula is more myelin equals more skill. Um, a good way to think about it is you're walking a trail that no one's walked before. Um, well, the pathway is not going to be very efficient. There's going to be a lot of rocks in the way, a lot of grass, whatever. But as more and more people start walking it, um, you see a pathway start to form. And then from there, you can lay down gravel and move on it a little more efficiently. And as time goes on, you can put concrete and turn it into a street and turn it into a highway. And that's essentially what myelin does. It creates, um, increases the speed and precision of your signals for that specific path pathway in your brain. Um, so this is the substance, sub substance that allows us to, uh, perf uh, allows us to get habits. Um, it, it allows us to adapt to new situations. And, and it makes sense from an evolutionary point of view. Uh, there has to be something to make us adapt to our surroundings. And this is the sub substance, I can't say that word, um, that allows us to do that. So that leads me to deliberate process. So this is essentially the process of building that myelin. Um, so the main guy I'm going to be referencing this talk is Anders Ericsson. Um, he's a professor at Florida State. Um, and his whole career is centered around studying expert performers, whether it be chess, music, business. He, he deconstructs what makes experts experts. Um, and you might have heard of the 10,000 hour rule. Um, that initially came from his research. Um, even though that rule is a little misleading, um, he said to where it, it really depends on the skill you're trying to do and the type of person you are. We all don't learn as quickly as each other. Um, but I mean, 10,000 hours is a decent average, but it's not like a one rule apply to all type thing. Um, and he coined the term deliberate practice. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. So this kind of sums up his, philosophy, his whole philosophy on skill is the right sort of practice over a sufficient period of time leads to improvement, nothing else. Um, and he stated time and time again that he doesn't believe there's anything at all relating to talent. He thinks the only way one person's better than the other is because they practice more efficiently and they practice better. Um, so here's kind of an overview of what deliberate practice looks like. Um, I mean, it's nothing too groundbreaking. We've all seen all these steps um, in whatever are growing up and learning how to do things. We all, we all have seen these before. Um, so the first step is you need to analyze and deconstruct what you're trying to do. Um, then you want to make goals that stretch yourself outside your comfort zone. Um, and then you need to focus intensely on the task that you are doing. Um, and then you need to actually perform that task. Then you need to measure what you did to where you should be and adjust what you did. And then you need to repeat that process until it's second nature. So um, it's important to talk about two types of skills before I, I dive into it. There, there's hard skills and soft skills. So you could think of a hard skill as repeatable and precise. So the example I have here is a golf swing, right? There, there are certain components you have to do. There's a certain sequence of events that have to occur to perform a good golf swing. Uh, but a soft skill is a little broader in nature. It's like, it will be equivalent to walking into a meeting and be able to read the room. There's a lot of different variables going on. There's a lot of different um, factors and only lots of experience can make up for that. Um, another good example is if you think of soccer, on a soccer, uh, soccer players on a, on a soccer field, uh, each situation is different. You can't really train, train that precise scenario, but you can train that um, general area. Um, but most skills, most overall broad skills, are a combination between these two. Um, and the overall process is, the, is about the same, um, the, the, but the practice differs a little bit. So to develop hard skills, you're more of a carpenter. You're more of um, piece by piece building that myelin in your brain, those skills component by component. But for soft skills, it's more of like a skateboarder at a skate park, 
right? You're, you're going, you're trying new things, you crash a couple times, you keep going, then you kind of find what sticks, and then you do that over and again, and you get good at it, and you try something new, um, just a little more trial and error based, um, more, more experimentation, I want to say. Um, all right. Um, all right, so the first step is you need to analyze and deconstruct what you're trying to do. And it's recommended to analyze a current expert in the field. Because um, if you think about it, I mean, there's a reason this person is an expert in the field. They're doing things right. Uh, but a lot of people are kind of wary, oh, that's stealing, that's whatever. Um, you, you know, that's, you're taking their intellectual property or however you want to phrase it. But the reality is, no matter what you do, there's, there's constants between uh, what you're trying to do, what they're doing. And I like to think of it kind of like an ice cream cone. Right, you have these constraints when you're filling up the cone itself um, that is required for anybody who wants to eat the cone. But once you get to a certain point, years down the road, yeah, you can add your own toppings to it and you can put your own flavor on it. Um, but the reality is you need these constraints and these uh, bounds initially to get to, point, to that point. Um, it's also, also worth noting, um, you need to be wary of experts. Usually an expert is the loudest person in the room or the loudest person on the internet. Um, you see this a lot with, in technology, uh, the people who blog the most or go to conferences the most are usually considered the experts, but if you'd quiz them, I, I don't think that'd be as true. Um, they're just the people who are in front of people more. So you assume they're an expert because you see them more, but that doesn't technically mean they're a thought leader in the field. Um, and the overall goal of this step is to look at the big picture itself and then break it into small, doable chunks. Um, and I'll talk about those chunks. So. When I refer to chunks, um, I might refer to it as mental representations. Um, they're chunks of inf information that represent a scenario that need to be repeated. Um, so our brains are really bad at, we have, we have a short capacity for uh, our working memory, our short-term memory. So what we do is we chunk information together to help us remember it. Um, so if you think your phone number, uh, it's like 913 and then you have three numbers and four numbers. Um, we do that because it helps us remember by grouping those individual data points together. Um, it allows us to recall it easier. And the same thing applies to uh, skill, is you can remember certain scenarios better if you chunk all the information in that, um, from that scenario itself. So a good example of this is some researchers took a beginner chess player, intermediate chess player, and a grandmaster. And what they did was they arranged the board to look like something in a normal chess game. And then afterwards, they took the board away and they quizzed each person and see how well they remember the board. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, the, the beginner did the worst and the grandmaster did the best. Um, but what they did next was interesting where they put random sequences of pieces on the board that, wouldn't look, that would never occur in a game itself. Um, and then they quizzed these people again. And what they found was the grandmaster only did slightly better than everybody else. So it wasn't pure memory power that allowed them to be good at what they were doing. It's their ability to chunk this information together and apply it to the game setting. And that's what ultimately separates top performers from non-top performers is the quality and quantity of these mental representations you form through the act of practice. Um, so a good way to think about it is a staircase that you're building while you're on it. So you, you're on the top step and then you need to learn a new mental representation or skill or component, and you build it, and then you take another step up, and slowly you can uh, have a nice stairway. So uh, once you deconstructed and you know what you're trying to do, um, it's important to create stretch goals. So if possible, try to simulate the actual environment that you're going to perform in. Um, it's been proven that if, just say you're given a presentation, if you can do that, practice that presentation in the room where you're going to perform it, you're going to end up performing better just because all the um, sensory information is the same and your body's more used to it. Um, these goals need to be measurable and clear and not abstract. Um, so there needs to be something you can definitely say, I, I, I accomplished the goal or I didn't accomplish the goal. Um, and a little caveat of this is, there's some situations that are just abstract and not, you can't quantify them very well. Um, what you do in those situations is just do something that, it's gonna have to be a rough estimate. It's not gonna be an exact, like I hit, I made 100 baskets or whatever. 
Um, it has to be something a little more broad, but still something you can look back to and see if you are consistently hitting a goal. Um, and an important factor with uh, these goals is it needs to be, it has to be just outside your comfort zone. Um, so we as uh, humans are adaptive. So what we want to do is when we're in an uncomfortable situation, our body wants to normalize it and we want it to not be as uh, conscious. We don't want to think about it more, we just want to do it. So what you're doing with these stretch goals is you're putting yourself in an environment where you have to adapt to the new set of parameters and eventually the goal is to normalize that behavior so you don't have to think about it anymore. So you have to make sure the goal is just slightly outside your comfort zone. Um, it's also important to focus and full attention is a requirement. Um, a shorter time with more focus is way more valuable than more time and less focus. Um, if you think about it, the higher your focus, the more you isolate your circuits and pathways in your brain, which result in more myelin created, which in turn results in more skill. But if you're not focused while doing something, um, you're not isolating those pathways and you're, not, you're kind of building other habits along with the one that you're trying to form. Um, so focus is a must, it's, it's not an option. Um, and that's, it's also important to stop when you're exhausted or you're losing focus. So an idea of an expert that we have, kind of a stereotype, is this person working 12-hour days, working all day, and you know, killing himself all day long. But in reality, if, if you look at the, the rituals of a lot of the top writers or top performers, um, what they do is they have chunks of time of high focus, and they have kind of less mentally rigorous tasks in between those, where they'll take a nap, they'll eat, they'll socialize. So they'll have high intensity periods where they know they can put out maximal effort, um, but they couple that with downtime. Um, so there's really only, when you think about focus, uh, there's only really two types of distractions, right? You have external distractions and internal distractions. So external is the world acting on you, and internal distractions is you acting on yourself. Um, so we live in a very distracting world, and uh, willpower itself is limited, self-control is limited. So what you need to do to stop these distractions is you need to build your environment around you to be distraction free. So what I do is I, I have a sight blocker on my laptop and I put my phone in airplane mode if I really need to focus on something. Um, and there's also ways to tame your inner emotions and thoughts. Um, I recommend some sort of meditation, um, a system like getting things done, which essentially puts all your things you have to do somewhere so you know where to access them at all points so you don't have to think about it, you don't let it rattle around in your brain all the time. But uh, mitigating these distractions is very important to the focus itself. Um, so once you control, it's amazing how much of this is in your control. Um, a lot of times you think of the world just constantly bombarding you, but there's a lot you can do to help you focus more. Um, so once you deconstruct your focus, now you have to actually perform the task itself. And like I said earlier, if you're within your comfort zone, it's kind of a rule, rule of thumb. If you're within your comfort zone, you're not improving. You're kind of reinforcing what you're already doing. Um, so struggle is not optimal. And like I said earlier, we're trying to adapt. And what you're trying to do is get yourself into a situation where your body wants to normalize that action and adapt to that situation. Um, and when you perform, you, all, you have to be prepared to be bad. And it's, it's stupid to think that if I'm going to try something totally new, if I tried I don't know, a sport I've never tried before, I'm gonna be good at it immediately. It's, it's, kind, of, um, it's kind of stupid, but uh, the, the performance itself shouldn't be easy, and you can always tell if you're improving if, if it's easy or not. Um, so after you perform the task, it's, it's important to use those goals to um, check the feedback, um, evaluate the gap between what you did and uh, where you wanted to go. Um, this is where the clear and measurable goals really come into play. Um, this is also where having a coach, uh, having a mentor, or just a way to monitor yourself if you don't have either of those is really important. Um, and we, when you're f firing suboptimal circuitry in your brain, um, feedback is necessary to know, to point yourself in the right direction so you can um, adjust. Um, and there's, you know, no feedback. It's, it's really hard to improve if you have no feedback. You're just going to be doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and you hear the adage all the time, fail fast when you're doing things. Um, I honestly think that's a little misleading. I think it's get feedback fast. Um, if you can avoid failure overall, do it. Uh, but there's some situations where you can't. Like, if you're starting a company, well, the only way you're going to get feedback is, you know, you might burn the company to the ground. 
but uh, um, that's all. I mean, that's those those scenarios. That's the only way you can get feedback on what you're trying to do. Um, and most importantly, I think is positive feedback is motivating. If you're trying to get better at something and you're not seeing progress, you're going to end up quitting because you know where's what's the point if you're not seeing progress. So this also comes back to the goals itself. If you if you chunk the goals small enough, you'll be able to see the step by step process towards the direction you want to go. Um, right. So once you get perform, once you get the feedback, um, you want to adjust what you're trying to do. Um, so I, I like to think about it as like you're moving through a dark room, right? So you, you don't know where all the furniture is. You go in the door and then you hit the couch or whatever. And then you learn from that. And then you move to the right and you hit the nightstand or something. I don't know. It's a weird room. But, um, but you get the point. Is It's a lot of trial and error. Um, and it's important to note that it's, it's not how fast you can do it. It's how slowly you can do it correctly. Um, so along with that, uh, exaggerating the motion, exaggerating what you're trying to do itself will help it uh, stick out more to you. Um, and it's also important to note that if you're not improving at something, trying harder is probably not the solution. You want to try something different. You want to point it, you want to go in a different direction um, because you're obviously doing something wrong. You're, you're, if you're trying harder and nothing's improving. So it's important to understand that and be prepared to pivot a little bit. Um, so once you go through the whole process, um, once you've done something correctly, uh, it's important to replay the process and remember how it felt and remember what you did to do it correctly. That way you can repeat it again and again. Um, so you want to get to the point where you're repeating this the stretch goal that you initially created over and over again to where, um, like I said, you're, you're adaptive and you normalize. You don't have to think about it anymore. Um, and that, that's truly when the skill is formed and it's useful to you is when you don't have to think about it and it's just integrated in your everyday life. Um, right, so once you form that small little chunk, that small little goal, be prepared to start over again with another stretch goal. Um, so, you know, this is, it's a marathon. If you, if you want to be really good at something, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You're not going to be good in a year, not even two years. Um, it's going to take multiple multiple years to get good at some of the same process over and over again where you slowly build um, those smaller skills. Um, and like I said, it's good to think about it like a staircase that you're building while you're on it. So in conclusion, um, it takes a long time to be an expert. Uh, it's a simple process, but that doesn't mean it's easy to do. So it's hard to execute, hard to do right consistently. Um, so it's important to create clear and concise goals. Uh, make sure you're outside your comfort zone. Um, yeah, make sure you're intense focus. Um, you have intense focus when you're doing it, and if you're not focused, stop and wait till later and do it. Um, get feedback as often as you can, and repeat and reap the benefits. And that's all I had. <laughs>